Hallelujah. How many know you have the victory in God this morning? Amen. Does anybody know they have, the, they have the victory in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning? Amen. Can we rise to our feet today? God has given his people the victory. Even though you may not see it yet, you may not see the details of it, you can't understand it with your rationality, with your mind, but you have the victory today. Woo. And can I tell the church this morning, that even though you may not be able to see it, you could still praise him for giving you the victory. Right? Because God is faithful. He has been faithful yesterday. He is faithful today. And he will continue. Hallelujah. He will continue to be faithful. Amen. How about we lift our hands right now. We just glorify the Lord Jesus because he's on our side today. We love you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, this morning for all that you are doing in our lives today. We thank you, God, for the Holy Ghost. We thank you for your blood. We thank you for your name, God, that is a strong tower today. Your name that assures us the victory. Your name that assures us, God, protection. We thank you for your name today. Oh God, we praise you, God, for that name. Because you've given us a reason. You've demonstrated by your power your goodness today. Hallelujah. Woo! Church, as we go in this morning, I feel the Holy Ghost. How about we praise him with victory in our spirits today? Come on. How about we praise him with victory in our hearts and in our minds? Come on. Somebody lift up a joyful noise to God and a sound to heaven, giving him glory this morning. Hallelujah.
many know there's nobody greater? There's nobody greater than our God, amen. All you have to do, you don't even have to think back that far. You can think back to this morning, amen. He woke us up this morning. He started us on our way, amen. We have the activity of our limbs, amen. He's such a great God, hallelujah, hallelujah.
much of him as you want. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I would like us one more time, all across the building, uh, you've heard it preached here. If you haven't, you're going to hear it from me, how, how powerful the unity of the body of Christ is. So would you right now, in this unity... Would everybody in the building, would you stand with me? If you can, if, would you please stand? And I want us to really let the Lord know how good He is. I feel His presence here in a tremendous way. And He's already ministering to people. Those that don't want it aren't getting anything. <laughs> I watch it, people stand there and get nothing out of this. And that amazes me. When the presence of the Lord is in here, all you got to do is reach out and just touch Him. That's all you have to do. So would we do that together right now? Would you just reach out and just touch Him and just let Him, Lord, thank you, Lord. Thank you for touching my brother. If I don't feel you, Lord, thank you for touching my brother and sister. Thank you for your presence here right now. You are good. Your mercy is everlasting. Your truth endureth to all generations. Come on, somebody in this place, would you just touch him and let him know right now, hallelujah, how good he is. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, come on, church, that's it. All across the building, uh, would you just let it out? Uh, would you just give it to him? Uh, would you honor the king? Uh, would you honor the savior of your soul? Uh, would you honor the master of the universe? Uh, would you honor him?
I could stay right here all day. What an atmosphere we have right now. As I was standing over at the side, I often think, okay, we're going to come and lead in prayer. We're going to pray for one another. But it's a, there's a human tendency to always think about yourself first. It just is. It's not, not an evil person because you think that. But there's a human tendency to think about yourself first. But there's a principle that the Lord wanted to teach us, and that is it is more blessed to give than to receive. That just, it's always confounded me in so many different ways, but it's still true, and I've watched it work. It is more blessed to give, and you say, well, how does this fit in prayer? How much more do you give in prayer than you try to get? There's so many people that need your prayer right now. When I look across this audience here today, and I see in my finite mind, it means it's limited, and the unlimited mind of God, how He knows you already. But the amazing part about it is, you know someone here today, yourself, that needs prayer. Would it be more blessed to give? How about let's do our kingdom prayer? You know someone in this city. You know somebody that they need to be in this house. They're trying everything, and it just ain't working. Like the song said, they've looked, they've searched, and they don't got anything. But could we pray this morning with knowing that it is more blessed to give than to receive? So I want us to pray for our valley. We're going to pray together. I want us to pray for the city of Stockton. I want us to pray for this nation. It's in a mess. If you haven't figured that out yet. It's in a mess. And it doesn't look like anything's going to change anytime soon. But I do know one thing, that he's in control. And you know the next thing I know, hear me when I say this, is your prayers matter. I don't care if you're the only one praying for someone else. That's all God needs is someone to respond in faith. So would you bind with me? I, and and I'm, I'm passionate about this. If we're going to do it, why waste time doing it half-hearted? Let's do it. Go home if you're half-hearted. Let's pray. There's a soul outside these doors. There's, there's a city outside these doors that needs Jesus bad. So would you join with me right now, knowing that your prayer is going to work right now. It's going to touch somebody here in this valley today. When you pray right now, is going to touch somebody in this valley. Would you believe that with me right now? Would you lift a hand toward heaven right now? Would you pray for someone? Call out their name right now. Call their name out. Come on, call their name out. Your neighbor. The one you work with on your job. In Jesus' name, Lord. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, O Lord. It is your will that none perish, but that all come to repentance. God, we're not praying in vain. We're not praying amiss, but we're praying your will. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Oh God, let us see the fruit of our labors today. Let us see the fruit of our labors today. Every prayer that's been prayed here today, 
today. Uh, let a soul be touched. Uh, let a heart be touched. Uh, let a spirit be revived. Uh, let someone be renewed in the Holy Ghost. Uh, in the name of Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you believed your prayer worked this morning, turn to someone and give them a high five and tell them my prayer works. Come on. My prayer works because I believe in Jesus. My faith is in Jesus. That's why. Hallelujah. Come on. Somebody believes it today. Hallelujah. Don't you doubt it. We have not because we ask not. So keep asking. Amen. You may be seated for a moment. Hallelujah. Got a few announcements here to uh, bring to you. For the music and the sound ministry, you have to excuse me, I don't have my glasses, so I'm going to squint, okay? Still can't read that. That's okay. It's like font 0.5, I think. Sound ministry, music ministry, if you can, if you're interested in joining and becoming a part of it, please uh, call the office and let them know, and they probably says something else here, but we'll figure it out. Amen. Baby dedication. <laughs> Sound like a daddy over there. <laughs> it's coming up. Please look at your bullet at the website or the bulletin. Let all the ladies say amen. amen. You're coming up, ladies advance. Please remember that in October. And then also starting this Wednesday night, our uh, revival with Brother Landon Gore is going to be kicking off. Amen. Amen. There's a lot of things happening during this summer, and we want to uh, make sure that everybody's staying revived and alive with the Lord, what the Lord is doing. He's doing something every day. Just got to be paying attention. Get in, get in the river. Jump in the river and go along with what he's doing. Amen. Amen. So remember these things. If you're interested, I'm telling you what, you need to be involved. If you're not involved in the church, you're wasting your talent. By the way, there's a parable on that if you want to go find that in the Scripture too. Don't waste your talent. Use it for the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Remember all the things that are happening. I know we're getting close. We're right smack dab in the middle of summer. School starts here another month or so. And all the parents said amen. 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 <laughs> uh, that means you're not too sick of your kids yet. That wasn't too good. So you're, you, you're still good with your kids being at home. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to take our Sunday morning tithe and offering. Amen. There's a lot of ways to do that online, texting and different things. But why don't you all stand with me right now and we're just going to pray in everything with prayer, in everything with prayer. How many had food on your table this week? What I've seen so far, everybody's got shoes on their feet. Come on. We are blessed. We are blessed. Lord Jesus, thank you for your blessings that are on your people. Those that are struggling, Lord. God, I know that the, their faith, I pray that it would stay strong in you, but they would respond to your principle. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And if they are faithful with their tithe and their offering, Lord, you, yourself, would rebuke the devourer and pour them out upon them a blessing they are unable to contain. We stand upon your word today, Lord. Bless your people and bless this offering. 
in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. we give a hand praise to the Lord today. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Can we stand to our feet for just a few moments? Amen. Can anybody feel what I feel in the atmosphere this morning? Hallelujah. It's like a divine flow. It's like a current, right? It's like a a signal. It's like a signal, a radio signal, right? And the Lord wants us to tune in. Amen. He wants us to jump in the flow. And if you jump in the flow of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is going to carry you. The Holy Ghost is going to change you and transform you. I don't know about you, but I want to step in to the will of God today. Hallelujah. Come on. I want to step in to the will of God today. It's something divine that's occurring in the atmosphere. It's like in my spirit, I feel this sense of anticipation, almost like you know that you're about to go on vacation. You're about to go on this big trip that you had planned for for so long. I feel that sense of anticipation. and I don't know quite where we are going, but I know we're going somewhere in the Holy Ghost. We're flowing. Some, anybody feel that this morning? We're flowing somewhere. Hallelujah. And I don't need to know exactly where we're going, but I know we're going to be blessed. We're going to have victory. God's going to do something great and mighty today. Before beginning in the word and and sharing what the Lord has placed in my heart for you today, how about we just lift our hands today and get connected and worship the Lord. Can we do that right now? Somebody just lift your hands and say, God, whatever you want to do today. Lord, whatever you want to do today, God. Oh, we love you, God. We love your word. We love your spirit, God. We love that divine touch, God, that is in this place. Hey, help us to step in, God, this morning. Help us to step into the flow of your word today. Help us to step in, transform our hearts and our minds, Lord God, today. As we open them to listen, God, and to hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One more time, church. Just give a hand praise to the Lord. 
We love you. We love you, God. Yes, 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 yes. Woo, hallelujah. Thank you, God. Yes. Second Samuel chapter 22. If you can just open that with me. Second Samuel chapter 22. We love you, God. We love you, we love you, we love you. We love your word. We love your spirit today, oh God. Second Samuel chapter 22. We're going to read verse 29 through 30. And then we're going to go to 32 through 35. The word of God says, For you are my lamp, O Lord. The Lord shall enlighten my darkness. Hmm. For by you I can run against a troop. By my God I can leap over a wall. Hey. Verse 32. For who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? God is my strength and power. Hey. And he makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of deer. Come on. And he sets me on my high places. He teaches my hands, oh, to make war. Woo! Let me say that again. He teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. I feel the Holy Ghost today. You may take your seats in the presence of the Lord. Yeah, I feel God. I feel God. I feel God. Now, I took you here to this passage of Scripture. This passage of Scripture is actually one of the final prayers that King David prayed. The Word of God says that this is a, a psalm that he gave, gave to the Lord. This is actually Psalm 18, if you, if you would like to go read it. It's the exact same utterance here. And the Lord gave this psalm to David after the Lord had delivered David from all of his enemies this is a psalm of victory this is a psalm that summarizes the attitude of david toward all the victory that god had given him in war and in this psalm we see a clear declaration of glory that is given to god for helping him win his battles the Word of God says here that he, and it, it, it demonstrates David's confession that it wasn't by his own power and his own might that he practiced and obtained victory. But he says that my power is God. God is my strength and God is my power. You see, David could have easily taken credit for the victory that God had given him. He could have taken credit for all of the battles that he fought because he fought with the sword in his own hand. And he fought against the Philistines and he fought against the Amorites and he fought against all the individuals that were there in the land of Canaan, the land of promise. But in the midst of his victory, he said, I cannot receive glory for the victories that God has given me. It is God that is my power. It is God that has been my strength uh, and it is he hallelujah Woo. you see one of the most powerful parts of the scripture here is it says that he teaches my hands to war we're talking about a seasoned warrior speaking this he is a seasoned man of war by this time he had fought many battles every year he would go out to fight a battle and yet, even in the midst of his excellence in knowledge of war, he says, it is still God that teaches my hands to war. You see, this is a nature, this is a thing that he learned to do since a very young age. Because the word of God says that in the beginning of David's ministry, we see that God had anointed him to be king as a boy. 
as a child who took care of the sheep. He took care of his father's sheep out in the pasture, out in the wilderness. His older brothers were men of war who would go out and fight for King Saul. But David, he took care of his father's sheep way out in the wilderness where he had no access to a general and no access to anyone who would teach him how to wield a sword who could teach him how to war, who could teach him how to fight against the Philistines. But one day the Lord came along and he sent Samuel, the prophet Samuel, to his home. And the word of God says that he poured anointing oil upon David's head because God had anointed David to do something powerful for the kingdom. God had anointed this boy named David to be king over Israel because he was a young man that was aligned after the heart of God his heart was aligned with the heart of God he knew how to worship God he knew how to praise God he knew how to give God glory he knew how to live in his will All, already he was singing psalms and worshiping the Lord and the Lord chose him to do something mighty but even after God had anointed him to be king, he still went out to the wilderness to tend to the sheep. He still went out to the wilderness where there was no one to be a mentor to him. No one to tutor him. No one to tell him, look, this is the strategy. If you're going to win a battle, you have to do it this way and do it that way. And if you're going to wield a sword, you got to swing it this way and you got to swing it that way. If you know anything about war, war is just not about shooting wherever you want to go to shoot and swinging however you want to swing. If you have no training, you're going to die. But yet here is a young boy who was anointed to be a king over a kingdom and he was yet sent out to the field where no one could train him and no one could tutor him but it is there in the field where he felt the anointing of God come upon him and the spirit of God that was beginning to teach his hands how to war the word of God says that out in that field that the lion and the bear would come. And when the lion and the bear would come to take the sheep that he was in charge of, the anointing would come on him to fight these animals and to fight them off from the territory that God had given him. And in the midst of those experiences, God was teaching his hands how to battle and teaching his hands how to war. The time came when the Philistines would come and they challenged Israel. And a great warrior came named Goliath. A great giant came to meet with Israel. This giant challenged them and said, hey, you give me your best and I am the best of the Philistines. You send me your best. Let's fight. And whoever wins is the Lord of the other nation. And nobody wanted to challenge Goliath. But there was one young boy. One young man. And you see, he was already known by that point in time. If you read the word of God, you, we see that they actually already knew about David. They already knew about him. He wasn't unknown. He wasn't some unknown young man. He was a young man that they knew. Look, this guy, he's already done things and he's killed lions and he's killed bears. He's done all, he was already a great man, but he had not fought any real wars. He had fought animals. He had fought lions. He had fought bears. Yet he knew what it meant to, to be under the unction of the power of God. This is why when he went out to meet Goliath, he knew that it's not by sword. It's not by might. But in the name of the Lord. Woo! He knew he could have victory in the name of the Lord. Because it wasn't by the skills of his own hands. But by the anointing of God that was guiding his hands to fight. This is why David could clearly say, he teacheth my hands to war. Because before then he didn't know how to fight giants. He didn't know how to fight Goliath. But he knew there was something on the inside of him that was moving him and driving him to victory. Wow. This is so powerful here. Because the Lord had called him. The Lord called David. A man who truly was unfit from the eyes of man to be a king over a nation. A young man 
that by the rationality of, man, of, of mankind, if you would measure him up to all of the other warriors of that time, he was not good enough. He was not educated enough. He was not experienced enough. But the anointing of the Lord was upon him. The anointing of God was in him. You see, I relate so much to this, and I believe this is a concept that the church of the living God can relate to completely. Because so many of us, we were not born in this thing. And even those of us who were born in this thing, many times it took us a while to get on board. And we don't have experience many times. We haven't had experience with living for God and experience in doing things for God. And even those who have had decades and decades of experience... The truth is, is that we have a foe that's not just tens and hundreds of years old. We are against a foe that is thousands years old and has had experience fighting against the will of God. We're talking about a satanic realm that even if you've been living for God since your childhood, he already has more experience than you. He already has more. He has, he has more battles than you. He knows more than you, yet he here we are a people called by God to be the established kingdom of God on earth and who am I to think that I can come against Satan and win if somebody would measure me against him they would surely see oh he's not good enough he's not smart enough oh man the enemy knows more than him but what the enemy cannot plan for is that I've been anointed by the Spirit of God you see it's not by my own power that I'm here it's because it's the power of the ancient of days that is invested in my spirit because God is our power and God is our strength. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost today. Woo. See, I feel the boldness of God. And it's not because I'm arrogant. It's because I know the God that I serve is mighty. He is mighty. He is mighty. He is mighty. And he works victory through his people. However, the war that David fought... The war that David fought in his time, it is not the same as the war that we fight today. The war that we fight today is a bit different. Therefore, if we are going to learn from the experience of David, where God taught his hands how to war, we are going to have to locate the place of battle and war for our age. Because the war that we are fighting in our age, it's not a war of political lines. And it's not a war of national lines and citizenship. It's not a war of the kingdoms of this earth. So we need to locate the place of our war and our battle very clearly. Now this is why I want to take you here to Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10. Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10. The Apostle Paul speaking to Ephesus says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Wow. So now we've located the place of war for the people of God. It is not against flesh and blood but it's against the principalities that are driving the flesh and blood that are behind the flesh and blood these are principalities these are powers that are sitting in high places and what is a high place a high place in that time is a it's a place of authority 
It's a place of dominion. When you are fighting in a battle, it's oftentimes the best position to always be on the high ground. When you are on the high ground, you are in a place that is most likely to have victory over your enemy because you have the high ground. This is why these enemies, the, the principalities of darkness, they are described as being in high places. They are in heavenly places. They are in places of authority where they're moving and they're shifting people around and they're they're propagating thoughts and they're propagating people that would be aligned to their ideals and these are powers and principalities in the heavenly places wow in verse 14 it says as a result of this war that the people of God fight stand therefore don't run Stand, therefore, hmm. having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. And this next part is very important. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Wow. Hallelujah. Wow. So we see here in Ephesians, the apostle Paul, he is speaking a word. And he says, look. Our battle, our fight, it's not against flesh and blood. It's not against man. It's not against uh, the, the, the leaders of this world. It's not against, in his time, it would have been Rome. It's not against Caesar himself, but it's against the principalities that are behind this man. You see that in Ephesians, he goes on to say, put on, put on in your waist, Take up the whole armor of God. It says, Have, having girded your waist with truth and the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. See, this isn't the first place that this kind of language is expressed. In fact, the only other place that describes this kind of thing that the Apostle Paul is talking about is found in Ephesians 59 verse 15 and I want to take you there because it is important for us to understand our role as the church to understand the passage of scripture that the apostle Paul is calling from and preaching from in Isaiah 59 verse 15 it says so truth fails and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then the Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing Woo! and was clad with zeal as a cloak what is this talking about Isaiah is prophesying about a future point in time but it's also speaking about God's perspective of the world of Israel and of humanity and he speaks of Isaiah observing or God observing the world. And God said, look, I do not see justice in the land. I do not see peace. And those who want to walk in righteousness, they are hunted like prey. Those who want to stand for the right thing, they are hunted like prey and they are suffering. He said, and I saw no man to be an intercessor. Therefore... His own arm brought salvation for him. Woo. So God said, look, there is no man to represent me on earth. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to come down for myself. 
Hey, hey. He said his own arm. I'm going to come down and I will be justice for myself. No one wants to fight for me. So I'm going to go down and I'm going to fight for my own name. For my own self. See, this is why God had to manifest in the flesh. This is a, a, an, an extremely oneness passage because it is, it is talking about the Lord God who came down and was salvation for the God, for his people, for himself. That means that Jesus Christ was none other but the Lord himself in the earth reconciling the world unto himself. See, God couldn't find a man, so he came himself. Uh, he came in Jesus Christ. Uh, and when he came on the scene, he had the breastplate of righteousness. He had the helmet of salvation. And it said he was clothed with vengeance. Huh? He was clothed with vengeance. Uh, see, he didn't come uh, to establish peace with the enemy. He came with the sword in his hand uh, to be a warrior in the land uh, and say, devil, you can't have have these people you can't have this nation you can't have this world so Jesus Christ invaded the kingdom of Satan the prince of the air Jesus Christ came and he invaded with power and with vengeance he, he came to take vengeance on the enemy See, not on the kingdoms of this world. He came to, to enact vengeance against Satan, against the principalities of darkness. And when he stepped on the scene, they knew this. They began to manifest. Says, I know who you are. You're the son of God. He'd say, shut your mouth and come out of him in Jesus' name. He laid hands on the sick and they would recover. He laid hands on the eyes of blind and they would see. And he prayed for those who were full of demons and they would be set free. This was the power of God and the right arm of God enacting salvation for himself. So the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation doesn't begin with the church. It began with Jesus himself. And if the apostle Paul says, you know that helmet of salvation, go ahead and put it, hey, put it on yourself. You know that breastplate of righteousness, you take that breast. Who wore this first? Jesus wore it first. But you know what? It's now yours. Ooh, <laughs> Jesus wore this helmet first. It's like if you're inheriting something precious and something mighty. Because when Jesus came on this earth, he came as a warrior with a sword to, define, to divide son from father. And he came to establish his kingdom, but he rose to heaven. And what did he leave on earth? He left the helmet of salvation. And he left a breastplate of righteousness. And he left garments of vengeance not so that they can remain on the floor but so that the church of the living God can take the helmet and put it on you take the breastplate you put it on you take the sword which is the word of God oh I feel him I feel him I feel him somebody's got to take up the helmet today somebody's got to take the breastplate today somebody's got to take garments of vengeance can I tell you something living for God is not a passive endeavor living for God is not a passive thing neither is it a peaceful thing we are in a real war but our battle is not against flesh and blood but against principalities you see there is a, a particular mindset that comes upon an individual, on an individual, and they know they're in war. There's a particular attitude towards the enemy when you know you're not just fighting for your life, but you're fighting for the lives of others. That's where courage gets a hold of you. When you realize there is a real danger at the door. There's a real enemy at the door. 
There's a real enemy who is seeking to devour. There's a real enemy that's trying to get a foothold. He's trying to get a foothold in our families. He's trying to get a foothold in this church. But let me tell you something. Meanwhile, there's a people of God that is taking upon themselves. Hey, the garments of vengeance. The garments of power in God. The garment of the name of Jesus. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We're going to keep pushing the devil back. We're going to keep pushing against the darkness. We're going to keep, hey, call the boat shot. We're going to keep pushing against. Hey, hey, he's pressing against the door, but it doesn't matter. I'm pressing back. He's fighting against the church, but it doesn't matter. I'm fighting back. I'm fighting back. I'm making a move with vengeance in my spirit, with vengeance in my soul. The enemy has tried to tackle this church for too long. The enemy is trying to defeat this church for too long. I got vengeance in my spirit and I'm coming for blood. And I can already smell blood, right? Where so many people are coming to God. You may have thought that COVID would have got us down, but no. There are people in this audience right now who have been baptized in Jesus' name just in these past few months. They've been filled for the Holy Ghost with the Holy Ghost. And I tell you what, Satan didn't want it, but last week I prayed for our city in our city parade. I smell blood in the camp of Satan and I'm not slowing down because I got vengeance. I have vengeance in my spirit. I have vengeance in my soul. It's time for us to keep praying. It's time for us to keep preaching. We're not slowing down on this thing. We're putting the shift in gear and we're moving forward. We're letting this thing move on. I feel them in the house today. There's a church that's rising up in the spirit this morning. My God, my God. Oh, la You know, and it makes it so so precious to me, right? Because it, in, this image really struck my spirit this morning. Is the thought of armor that Jesus left behind. The thought of a used helmet that has been left behind. Of a used breastplate that is left behind. And he's waiting for his church to pick it up. Because the fact that the Apostle Paul was describing this about Ephesians means that we are a continuation of the ministry of Jesus Christ on earth. Which is why we are called the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ because we're supposed to continue to do what Jesus did. We're still supposed to preach the gospel to the poor. We're still supposed to preach freedom and liberation to those who are chained in bondage of darkness. So it's very important for us to know the locale of our war and our battle. Second... Corinthians chapter 10 verses 4 through 5 it describes this same dynamic even more succinctly it says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but they are mighty through God to do what for the pulling down of strongholds hey is it pulls down arguments And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Submitting every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Wow. This pinpoints our war even even more focused here. And this is really important because now we understand that... These principalities that are sitting in high places, these rulers of darkness, their goal is not just to influence people and not just to, to make people feel uncomfortable or to, or to uh, uh, possess individuals. The goal of Satan is to 
win their minds, the mind of the world. The goal of Satan is to win the thoughts of humanity. Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but powerful through God to the pulling of the strongholds. What are those strongholds? But every high thing that exalts itself against the what? The knowledge. Anything that is exalting itself against the truth of the knowledge of God. So we're not just talking about a battle of prayer and a battle of spiritual strength. We're talking about a warfare of doctrines. We're talking about a warfare of worldviews and perspectives and cultures. We're talking about a warfare of mindsets, of convictions that are exalting themselves against the knowledge that there is one God in heaven and his name is Jesus. That's what we're talking about today. That helps us understand the reason why the sword of the spirit is the word of God. Because this is not, jo- not, not just talking about a spiritual strength and, a, and, and excitement in the Holy Spirit. This is talking about the word of God. And the way that we fight as the people of God is just as much about preaching as it is about prayer. It's just as much about speaking the word as it is praying in the prayer room. We cannot give up one for the other. Go to one and give up the other. We can't spend our full time preaching and not praying. We can't spend all of our time praying and not preaching because it is the word of God that pulls down the strongholds. You know what that tells us? That tells us, that gives us some details to understand who is building these strongholds then. We know there are principalities. We know there are things and dark, dark presences and dark authorities in high places. Where are these strongholds being built? Well, if you think about it in terms of an institution and institutions, it becomes quite clear. Where these kinds of strongholds are being propagated? We go at the lowest level, at the most general level. And we can see that many times, and those of you who have lived in the world, you you did not live your whole life in the things of God, you understand this quite clearly. Is that there are times where even our own culture that we grew up in as infants and as children and as young people, it is in dis, in, it's, it's disagreeing with the word of God and what God wants of us and is asking of us. I don't know about you, but I experienced it myself. I was always surrounded by individuals and surrounded by, not my family, thank God my family served the Lord, but being in the public school system, you're surrounded by other thoughts and other mindsets. And you know what the enemy was trying to do? He was trying to establish brick after brick, a stronghold that was in my mind that resisted the knowledge of God. If we continue on and we just examine the institutions of this world, then we can see that there right now there are teachers, even in our public schools and in our universities, that are speaking things, attempting to construct mindsets in young people that don't know better, constructing things in their minds to exalt it against the knowledge of God. And these aren't passive things. These aren't just unbiased things. No, no. These are the worst kinds of things. Uh, these are, the, these are the, the, the attempts of Satan to establish strongholds in the minds of humankind with extreme bias. In the name of being unbiased. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in the last year of my educational program, and I can tell you one thing is for sure. It doesn't matter where you go to or what teacher you've been to. Any kind of teacher that says that they are unbiased, they are a liar. They are biased. And they're the worst kind of biased. They're the kind of people say, I'm unbiased. Listen to me. There is no God. They don't even know that they're biased. That's the, that's the most dangerous kind of biased. 
I'm unbiased. No, no. I am rationally looking at this. No, you're not rationally looking at this. If you were rational, you would be able to see that if there is one God who created this world attempting to redeem the world to himself. Yeah. And you know what? I'm not sitting here saying that I'm unbiased. I'm here sitting saying I'm biased. I'm just admitting it. I'm, I am the best kind of biased. I am the biased that, that is an apostolic, one God-believing, tongue-talking, holy roar. Oh, I'm biased. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. I believe in the gospel. You better believe I'm biased. You better believe that I believe that if you want to get to heaven, if you want to get to eternal life, there is only one way, there is one truth, there is one life, and it's through Jesus Christ and none other. No one sits beside him. No one has ever sat beside him. He stands alone of God over heaven and of earth. He is the king of kings. Yes, he is. He is the Lord of lords. He is the alpha. He is the omega. Does anyone believe it this morning? He is the beginning. He is the end. He is God almighty. And I am not ashamed to say it. I'm not ashamed to proclaim it. This is the God that I believe in. Yes. And this is the word that he's given us. This is the word that he's given us. This is the truth. And it's designed to go against every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. You see, it's, it's one of my greatest observations. I teach a class in, at Christian Life College called Comparative Religions. And I've, I've made this observation about different belief systems. We study Buddhism, Islam, and cults in the occult. And there's another class at Christian Life College. We, have, we study Jehovah's Witness. We study Mormonism. And we also study Santeria and Voodoo. In witchcraft and in the years of my study and teaching uh, the students of Christian Life College I've come to understand this the places in which revival seems to happen more rapidly are places that are actually known to have more witchcraft they're in second world third world countries that hold on to things like shamanism right and usually these are groups of individuals who base their belief on experience and experiential things. Which is why if they should believe in other gods and they should sacrifice them and they believe in these kinds of shamanistic practices. When an apostolic believer steps on the scene and he begins declaring the name of Jesus over their lives. And he casts out demons and he heals the sick. Masses and masses of people, they come to God. They come believing in Jesus Christ. You know why? Because the truth is, is that a stronghold of conviction is a much stronger stronghold than possession itself. Possession is no match for conviction. Because you can rebuke the spirit from somebody, an evil spirit from somebody, but you cannot rebuke a thought you cannot rebuke something that they've decided in their mind to hold on to. Those kinds of things you can't pray out. You got to preach out. Those kinds of things you can't just pray. You got to declare the word and speak the word. And preach that out of their minds. Because we're talking of the strongest strongholds are strongholds of doctrines. Which is why it is in atheist nations. In nations that claim to have rationality and are consumed by atheist ideologies that are the most difficult to have revival in. Because they are less experiential and they're more based on the thoughts of the mind. You can't just go in and rebuke a spirit. You got to go in and preach the word. And the word of God has got to get in them and change them and move them towards God. That's a similar spirit that's here in the United States. 
and us being so close to San Francisco, especially, and Berkeley and all these institutions that are right now propagating systems of thinking that are against the knowledge of God. Right now, brick by brick, this young generation is being built up in ways of thinking that are naturally against the knowledge of God that are resistant to the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you see, that's not supposed to intimidate us. And that's not supposed to discourage us. I'm not saying that so that we can cower and we can give up and we can say, well, they're never going to believe in the gospel. No, 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 no. The position of the church of the living God is never that of backing up or standing by. Our position is always that of aggression forward moving believing hallelujah that God is going to give us the victory and if they don't believe it's all right we're going to keep preaching and we're going to keep praying and if this city keeps on trying to resist the will of God there is still a church in Stockton California that is declaring there is still a church in Stockton, California that is taking up the helmet of truth. It's taking up the breastplate of righteousness. We're taking up garments of vengeance and we're going out to the streets. We're preaching the word of God and we're praying revival. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're not to fear these cultural forming and these mental forming institutions that are cr creatively conjuring doctrines and worldviews that are contrary to the will of God and the word of God. No, because we have a doctrine of our own. We have a word of our own and we have a God that's attempting to establish his own kingdom on earth. And you know, this is a kingdom that's not just experiential and spiritual but it's a kingdom of doctrines as well. It's a kingdom of mindsets. It is a kingdom of a worldview. It is a perspective of the world. It is a way of understanding the world. It is a way of living your life. That is why it is not enough for us to just pray about revival and pray for ourselves and pray for our family. We got to get into the word. Because the kingdom of God has not yet been established in his full strength until we learn the word. Until we take the word and we obsess about the word and we make it part of our mind and we make it part of our heart and we get up in the morning and we meditate upon it upon our way and we sleep meditating upon the word. We walk with the word. We talk with the word. Hallelujah. This is why the most powerful people in the spirit, they are individuals that not only pray, but they know the word. And if something comes against us, we're not talking about things that we know in our human mouth we speak the word we recite the word we say the word of God says ah, hallelujah the word of God says he has made me more than a conqueror the word of God says yeah. have you noticed that the most powerful people in the spirit the most authoritative people in the spirit they're not people who can quote famous philosophical sayings and they're not people who can quote the self-help books and all kinds of fancy and funny sayings to try to motivate they're not people that are trying to access YouTube to motivate themselves but they're individuals who know the word of God and speak the word of God even in the face of adversity even in the face of impossibilities, we speak the word, we say the word, we believe the word, we walk in the word. And you know what you're doing? Every time you pray in the word, every time you preach the word, you're taking the sword of the spirit and you're moving and you're fighting and you're moving forward. We got to get more passionate about the word. We got to get more obsessed about the word. The people of God, we have got to know the word of God. And in the time of trouble, when you feel like you have no way out, guess what God's going to give you? He's going to give you a word and you're going to speak it. You're you're going to speak it against sickness. You're going to speak it against your situation. You're going to recite it. You're going to say it. And God's going to show up. That's right, he is. He's going to show up. 
I don't know why it works this way. It just works. I don't know why God does it this way. He just does. You got to know the word. Wow. Yes, 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 yes. So we come back to the start of this message that I have to, for you today. We are in a war. We are in a fight. But our warfare, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, rulers of darkness, rulers in high places. You know who else is in high places? We are in high places. Because God has sat us in high places with Jesus Christ. The Word of God says that. And meanwhile, we're in this world. And this is what I want to say. Meanwhile, we're in this battle. It would be easy to feel inadequate. It would be easy to say, God, I don't have much experience, especially our youth, our young people. It may be easy for Satan to come to your mind and tell you, I'm not good enough. I don't know enough. I'm not strong enough. I don't, I don't know enough of the word. I don't know. But God is here to tell you this. He's here to teach your hands how to war today. Amen. Yes. Yes, he is. And if there's anybody else in this congregation, you feel intimidated. You're saying, I, I don't know if I could do this. I've never lived in this my whole life. And I, I don't know what the, what the process is. Uh, so many of us here, many times you feel like you don't even know how to praise God. How do, how do I know when to wave my hands and when to clap my hands and, and when to sing and when to shout? Uh, and how do I know when to preach the word of God and share the gospel with others? Uh, you may not know, but that's all right. Uh, you don't need, you don't need anybody to tell you how to do it here the word of God says that he will teach you and you can pray that you can pray that prayer he God teach my hands how to war because the truth is is that the kingdom of God is not slowing down it's moving forward and there's momentum in the Holy Ghost and the closer we get to the last days, the more God is going to require his church to be in situations that we are not trained for. That we don't have experience to be in. God is going to take many of you in this season of revival because God's bringing revival. He is in the name of Jesus. We're going to see this church filled. We're going to see it filled. Hey, call up old shot. And I rebuke the word of Satan that wants to resist that. We are going to see this church filled. Yes, we are. I feel that in the Holy Ghost. Ooh. But you know what that's going to require? That's going to require you to take jobs that you're not trained for. Why? Because there is a harvest of people in that new job. There's a harvest of people in your new place of employment that you need to reach with the gospel. God's going to take some of you young people into educational institutions with professors who have way more degrees than you. But you know what's going to happen? God's going to use you to win them and pray over them. That's right. You're, this church is going to put, be put into situations. These people, you, you, you're going to be put in situations that you're not trained for, that you're not ready for. But when you're in the midst of that situation, remember this word that I'm trying to give you today. He teacheth my hands to war. He teacheth my hands to war. God, I don't know how to do this, but teach my hands to war. God, I'm in a situation that I don't recognize, it's a, but you teach my hands to war. Lord God, I'm about to do this Bible study, and I don't feel like I have enough to give to them. He teaches my hands to war. Lord God, I've only been in church a few months, but this person, he wants to know about who God is. He teach my hands to war. Lord God, I've never preached this. I've never been this. Teach my my hands to war God needs a people that are just willing to pray and say God teach my hands to war teach my lips to preach 
Teach my mind to understand. Teach my heart to receive. You see, I know what that prayer is all about because uh, I, I am in a situation now and I have been in situations. Those of you who heard my testimony a few weeks ago on a Wednesday, you know I'm not supposed to be here, right? I got, I'm in the middle of my PhD, but can I tell you, I didn't even graduate high school. I had a 0.9 GPA at the end of my, I should not be here. I don't have the mental power. I don't have the will. I've never been trained with the will. But in every season, I had to pray, God, teach my hands to war. Because I don't, I'm called up, oh, shut up. I'm not good enough. I don't have enough intelligence. But you're calling me. You're calling me. And I hear you calling me. And I'm following you. <laughs> Woo! Some of you are going to find yourself in the middle of a battlefield and you don't know how you're going to get out. But it's in that moment you're going to take the sword in your hand and you're going to begin fighting in the Holy Ghost. And you're going to say, God, teach my hands. Teach my hands to war. Teach me how to use it. Teach me how to preach the word of God. See, that's about all the voice that I have left. But I'm trying to convince somebody today. You have the victory. You have the victory in Jesus. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to move forward. If God's calling you, if God's anointed you, he's going to empower you. He's going to give you the strength that you need and the anointing that you need. Can we stand to our feet today? My question for this church this morning, is there anybody who's willing to pick up the helmet of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, and the garments of vengeance? Is there anybody willing to go into these situations where God is going to teach your hands how to war? He's going to teach you how to fight. He's going to teach you to be what you need to be. Come on. There's an inheritance of war this morning. God has left his helmet down. He's left his breastplate of righteousness. He's left the sword of the spirit. And he's waiting for the church to pick it up. He's waiting for you to pick it up in prayer. He's waiting. He's waiting for somebody. Somebody pick up the helmet of Christ. Somebody pick it up. Somebody pick up the armor. It's time. It's time. It's time time for this church to march on we're marching on in the Holy Ghost we're marching on in the name of Jesus we're marching on with the sword of the Spirit hey God teach our hands to war today hey teach this church how to war teach this church how to battle in the Spirit teach this church how to move into revival teach this church He's teaching you right now. He's teaching you. Somebody pray in the Holy Ghost. God's teaching you. You may not feel like you're good enough, but God is calling you. He's calling you right now. He's calling you right now. Uh, somebody pray in the Holy Ghost. Somebody pray in the Holy Spirit. Somebody pray with war in your spirit. Somebody pray with vengeance in your soul. I'm going to get my family back. I'm going to get this city back. I'm going to get this church back. Somebody pray with vengeance. You don't have to know how to do it. God is giving you power. God is giving you anointing. God is pushing you forward. Acts 29, raise your hands right now. Acts 29, raise your hands. God, empower them in the name of Jesus. Fill them with boldness. Fill them with wisdom. Fill them with knowledge of your word. You're anointing upon them. God, more than ever before. God, with the passion to serve you. With the passion to live for you. Hey, somebody pray. Somebody pray in the Holy Ghost. Somebody's taking up their armor this morning. Somebody take up your armor. Somebody take up your armor. Take up your courage. Take up your courage. Your courage and move on. Take up your courage and march on. 
take up your courage in Jesus' name. He's teaching you. He's teaching you how to war today. He's teaching your hands how to war. He's teaching you how to leap over walls. He's teaching you because he is your strength. Hey, robo, shababa. He's teaching you how to pray today. God, in the Holy Ghost, he's teaching somebody how to pray. He's teaching somebody how to pray in authority. He's teaching somebody how to pray with power. There is power in the name of Jesus. Come on, get it, get it in the Holy Ghost today. Get your courage in the Spirit this morning. In the name of Jesus. There is power. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. 